Is high frequency noise interfering with data and control signals? Are high voltage spikes causing system failure? Premature motor bearing failure? Welcome to understanding variable frequency drive cables. We have registrants from Canada's north, east, west, all points in between, even Chile and Zimbabwe. Clearly the subject of variable frequency drives and VFD cables resonates everywhere. I'm your moderator, Anthony Kapkin, editor of Electrical Business Magazine. Welcome to you all, and thank you Nexans for working with us to deliver this information to you. Your presenter today is Isaac Mueller, a Nexans applications engineer with over seven years of experience in wire and cable and an electrical engineering background in inverter design. Be sure to visit ebmag.com slash webinars for all of our upcoming training sessions, where you'll also find links to recordings of past webinars. And with that, I will hand it over to Isaac Mueller. Isaac. Thank you, Anthony. Um, thank you all for joining this webinar. Today I will be reviewing some details that will hopefully help you better understand VFD cables and why they're a necessary component in a VFD system. I'm Isaac Mueller, Applications Engineer for Nexans. My responsibility at Nexans is technical support to our future and existing customers, covering building wire and cable applications for Canada and the United States. To keep it simple, building wire for us is any wire or cable that would fall under the Canadian Electrical Code in Canada or the National Electrical Code in the United States. I have been working at Nexans in this engineering role for over seven years now. Previously, I worked for a telecommunications backup power systems company specializing in inverter applications and design. Nexans has a long history in Canada and the US. In Canada, Nexan started as Canada Wire in 1911. In 1991, Canada Wire was purchased by Alcatel, headquartered in Europe. At this point, all North American facilities began to operate under the name of Alcatel Canada Wire. In 1993, Alcatel purchased BurkeTech, which becomes part of Alcatel Canada Wire, but operates under the name BurkeTech, an Alcatel company. In 2001, Alcatel spins off the Global Wire and Cable Division. This is when Nexans was created. In 2012, Nexans purchased Amber Cable. Today we'll be uh, looking at what makes a VFD different from other single speed motor systems, applications, advantages and complications of a system, compare various cable constructions, and provide a few cable installation tips. Traditionally, motors were single speed either on or off. To change the direction or speed of the motor, a mechanical system such as a gearbox or a contactor would have to be used. This adds mechanical components that require physical space and regular scheduled maintenance. A VFD allows the direction, speed, and torque of the motor to be precisely controlled with a very simple mechanical system. The physical space requirements are much smaller and the need for regular scheduled maintenance is at a minimum. A typical VFD is made up of three key components, a rectifier, a DC filter, and an inverter. The rectifier is usually made up of a series of diodes, but could be controlled semiconductors, such as silicone controlled rectifiers or SERs. The DC filter is usually made up of a few inductors and a large grouping of capacitors to smooth out the DC ripple from the rectifier. The inverter is usually made up of high-speed semiconductor switches, such as insulated gate bipolar transistors, IGBTs, allowing the inverter to chop up the DC output. Note that the input to the VFD is a sine wave, while the output is a pulse width modulated waveform, or PWM. The VFD is capable of varying the frequency and voltage of the fundamental waveform, or the lowest frequency component, thereby varying the direction, speed, and torque produced by the motor. VFDs are used in material handling and processing applications. These applications can be broken down into two categories, industrial applications and non-industrial applications. An example of an industrial application would be the drive motors for the paper rollers, presses, and so on for a paper mill. Even at Nexans, we use VFDs quite extensively. In our copper rod mill, as well as our wire and cable plants, VFDs are used to drive our extruders, our fans, 
pumps, and product conveyor systems. An example of a non-industrial application would be a chiller tower for a large building, such as a hospital, which has a number of cooling fans and pumps. There are a number of VFD manufacturers working to make our VFD lives easier and more profitable. We strongly encourage you to contact the VFD manufacturer for more information. Although we reference ABB documentation throughout this presentation, they are not the only experts in the market. VFD systems present a number of advantages and complications. The advantages are lower maintenance cost, Smoother starting is easier on mechanical components in the system and requires fewer mechanical components. Increased productivity. Easily change process speed. Extruders or paper processing machines are a great example of this. Energy savings. Running the motor at the optimal speed for the process rather than running at full speed or not. Smooth start and stop. By this we mean slowly ramping the speed up or down. This reduces the mechanical stress on the system and creates a safer working environment. Higher quality. Accurate speed control means process optimization, leading to higher quality product. All of these advantages are key financial reasons to consider VFDs over single speed drives. The complications experienced with VFDs are significantly reduced in severity when proper VFD cables are installed. These complications include electromagnetic interference or EMI, Outbound or inbound interference may cause issues with the VFD system, external wireless or even wired systems for that matter. Repetitive high voltage spikes. It is normal for these voltage spikes to reach 3.1 times nominal system voltage rating. Corona discharge, which could ultimately lead to conductor insulation failure. Reflected wave and standing waves, due to a difference in impedance between the cable and the motor. Under certain conditions, a pulse from the VFD can add to a pulse reflected back from the motor, resulting in a standing waveform. Possibility of motor bearing failures due to return currents not using the cable as the return path. Limited motor cable length, forcing the VFD to be installed very close to the motor, which may be impractical. If you don't use a proper VFD cable, these complications will cause failures in this and other systems. EMI is a great example of this. Back in 1996, a group of ABB engineers conducted a study which was published in an IEEE paper titled Evaluation of Motor Power Cables for PWM AC Drives. Even though the study is over 20 years old, it is still considered a reference study when it comes to VFD cables. This study looked at eight commonly available cables which were used to connect the VFD to the motor, focusing on five key performance concerns. Number one, minimize net injected ground current into drive system ground bus. This improves the drive system performance and increases the reliability of drive electronics. Number two, minimize common mode currents. This reduces the possibility of bearing currents, which cause the bearings to become pitted and fail from what seems to be, or seems like, a mechanical mode of failure. Number three, minimize motor frame standing voltage. This also reduces the possibility of bearing currents, but also increases safety. Motor frame standing voltage can present a shock hazard or a source of ignition in hazardous locations. Number four, best possible cable shielding. This will help reduce the likelihood of crosstalk between adjacent cables, either inbound or outbound, and reduce the possibility of interference with wired or wireless systems. Cable shielding will also help to reduce the inductive and capacitive coupling within the system, which can cause induced current or voltage, which could lead to a safety hazard. Number five, best possible cable ground path. It is critical that there be a long-term, low impedance, wide frequency range ground path from the motor to the drive. In the VFD system, the VFD creates a pulse with modulated waveform, which is sent to the motor by way of the VFD cable. The motor will move the rotor shaft based on the fundamental waveform, or the low frequency component, and reject all the other frequencies, effectively acting as a filter. 
from a few hertz all the way up to the 100 megahertz range. These low and high frequency currents will look for the lowest impedance back to the VFD. If you're using the wrong cable for your system, then these currents may return to the VFD by another means resulting in motor frame electrical shock hazard, ignition source for hazardous locations, motor and driven machinery bearing currents, and electrical interference with external wired or wireless systems. Here are some interesting facts about VFDs. VFDs have been used for HVAC systems and buildings for more than 40 years. About 5% of all motors are controlled by VFD. Sales of VFD technology is growing at a rate of more than 5% per year. A good tool for comparison of VFD cable constructions is considering transfer impedance. This is a measure of the shielding effectiveness, or rather the wide frequency range return path impedance. In one of ABB's technical documents, they discuss this idea of transfer impedance and set up a maximum acceptance impedance of 100 milliohms per meter over a wide frequency range from a few hertz to well beyond the 100 megahertz range. If a cable's transfer impedance is above this threshold, then it is unacceptable for use as a VFD cable. Looking at traditional building wire, such as Tech 90 or RW90 in conduit, we can see that the transfer impedance of these cables would be well above the maximum transfer impedance threshold. These cables are not acceptable for use as a VFD cable. Looking at one of the more flexible VFD cables available in the market, tinned copper braid VFD cables, higher frequency impedance is marginally acceptable, but there may be applications where cable flexibility is of utmost importance. An example of this would be robotic arms. This cable is acceptable for use as a VFD cable. A better VFD cable, which is nearly as flexible as tin copper braid, would be copper tape VFD cables. They offer better electrical performance when compared to the tinned copper braid VFD cables, yet remain flexible. The best electrical performance from a VFD cable is achieved using the corrugated aluminum sheath VFD cable. The compromise, however, is that these cables are not very flexible. In fact, once they're trained into position, they generally retain that shape. This makes these cables somewhat self-supporting, but not suitable for applications requiring flexibility. The key VFD cable characteristics are cross-link polyethylene insulation for the conductors, this insulation system provides a high dielectric strength to withstand repetitive high voltage spikes of two to three times the conductor voltage rating and offer a low capacitance, which helps improve the maximum possible cable length. Three symmetrically placed grounding conductors. These provide best cancellation of common mode currents and provide the lowest net injected ground current into the drive system and the grounding conductors plus the aluminum sheath, copper tape, or braided wire provide a balanced, low frequency range, low resistance path to ground, virtually eliminating bearing currents and the electrical shock hazard. Continuous aluminum sheath, copper tape, or braided wire. This provides a shield for high frequency electrical noise, preventing interference with data and control signals and provides a low impedance, high frequency bond path. PVC jacket or other non-metallic jacket ensures grounding at cable ends only, eliminating ground loops and resulting in no injected ground current and protects the cable from the installation environment. The selection of a VFD cable may come down to the details of the installation as well as the characteristics of the cable. Note that typical wiring cables such as RW90 and conduit or Tech90 cables should not be used for VFD applications. When it comes to the electrical performance of the cable, high frequency bonding in particular, the best overall cable design is the aluminum sheathed product. For an installation that demands repetitive movement of the cable, the best overall would be the braided wire construction. In these applications, applications requiring flexibility, do not use the aluminum sheathed cable. 
For an installation that requires a cable be self-supporting, for example, installed on Unistrut, or fastened to a wall or ceiling, the aluminum sheathed cable will perform the best. The aluminum sheath is designed to be hand-trained and will retain its shape once trained into place. Note that there may be minimum distance between cable support requirements in the local electrical code. If the cable is going to be installed in an environment where it requires mechanical protection, then the aluminum sheath cable may be the answer. This could save the installer having to install a raceway, such as conduit, for cable protection. So when it comes to suitability for installation in a VFD system, any one of the first three VFD cables should be selected based largely on the installation environment. Typical wiring cable not identified as a VFD cable, such as RW90 and conduit or TEC90 cables, should not be used for VFD applications. There are a few key items to remember when it comes to VFD cable installation. Use only symmetrical, three conductor shielded VFD cables. Do not break the cable shield, except for terminating in a shielded environment inside the metallic equipment enclosure, for example. The cable shield should be connected to ground by way of a short pigtail at both ends of the VFD cable. Remember, this is the return path for the high frequency currents. Use twisted pairs for communication cables to avoid crosstalk. Route power and control cables separately. Many of the VFD manufacturers have minimum acceptable distance suggestions between cables. See their product literature. Follow the VFD manufacturer's instructions. These are critical to a successful, trouble-free installation. They are the experts when it comes to drives. When terminating the cable shield, <clears throat> which is also a current path, it's important to electrically connect it to the protective earth terminal or ground at both the VFD and the motor. Choosing a cable connector that maintains 360 degree contact with the cable shield and the shielded enclosure is critical. In summary, a VFD controls a motor speed, torque, and direction, resulting in improved system efficiency. VFD applications include material processing and handling. The advantages of VFD systems include lower maintenance cost, increased productivity, and energy savings. The complications of VFD systems when proper cabling is not used include EMI, repetitive high voltage spikes in corona discharge. We have looked at the key characteristics of a true VFD cable design and briefly touched on the installation tips for these cables. Are there any questions? Well, thank you for that overview, Isaac. Uh, we definitely have time for some questions now, uh, so feel free to just type those into the questions panel that you see on your webinar interface. Uh, now, I have a, a couple questions here uh, just based on the presentation and to get the ball rolling. Um, one of the things that I was curious about is earlier on in one of your slides, you mentioned all the benefits uh, that are offered by variable frequency drives, yet only about 5% uh, market penetration for motors being controlled by VFDs. Uh, maybe you can talk about uh, a little bit about that disparity. You know, why is it that so few are being used? Uh, is it because of the, the fear of not getting it right? Or maybe you can tell me a little bit about that. Um, what we found um, in, in my brief seven-year period at Nexans is that VFDs present a lot of unknowns to many um, in, in the engineering world and the contracting world. And what's happened is many will install the systems as though they're typical building wiring systems. Uh, and so not apply the correct uh, filters, um, using cabling methods of traditional building wire systems, uh, and so on. And little do they know or realize that they're causing bigger issues and concerns. So I, I think it's a matter of just this, uh, this whole idea of the unknown and hearing uh, um, some negative press out there about VFDs and the complications that arise. There are a few that have generated companies out of troubleshooting VFD systems and actually turned down business. There's so much business out there just in troubleshooting. It's unbelievable. 
so I, I think it's slowly catching, um, slowly catching traction as people realize, as consumers realize that there are significant financial gains in, in the quality of the system and uh, process control and energy efficiency. Energy efficiency seems to be the big driver. So as that takes hold, you'll find more and more VFD systems hit, hit the market space. Uh, very good, very good. Uh, now, Isaac, I've, I'm actually going to combine two questions that uh, that we've received here. Uh, one of them is uh, an attendee writes, uh, "I've been installing VFDs for years. I've always used Tech 90 without any issues. Why should I even consider variable frequency drive cables?" And on top of that, uh, again, combining questions, someone else wrote in asking, "Is Nexan's aluminum sheath cable rated the same as Tech?" Two very good questions. Um, it's quite often that we get called on to supply a VFD tech cable. To be honest, we've heard of a few cases where tech cables have worked for the end user, for the client. Once we dig a bit deeper, we find that their grounding and bonding within their system far exceeds minimum code requirements. So they're reducing the impedance between the motor and the drive, thereby capturing more of those high frequency currents, yet they from time to time will experience issues with other systems, such as inability to use wireless communication devices through certain parts of the plant or the facility. Although they appear to be mitigating these bearing current issues or it, it's not apparent to them, they may be experiencing other issues with unrelated systems. It's not uncommon for data systems. Um, everything is going controlled by way of Ethernet cable or data systems. Any EMI generated by these VFDs could affect those systems as well. On the topic of VFD cables that we offer and how they compare to tech, we offer two different flavors of VFD cables, one for the Canadian market, one for the US market. The Canadian market cable is rated 1 kV, designed for 600 volt rated systems. Now with a 1 kV rated insulation system on our VFD cable, it could easily withstand voltage spikes in excess of 2000 volts. Keep in mind, a typical VFD operating at 600 volts would see voltage spikes upwards of 3.1 uh, times or approximately 1900 volts. So no issue there. In the US market space, we offer a 600 volt rated cable, again with crosslink polyethylene insulated conductors, the aluminum sheath armor, uh, and it's capable of operating with 480 volt drives, no issue. How they compare to the tech cables? Well, one key difference is that in circuit size conductors, well, you could get ultimately a 600 volt rated cable circuit size, 14 gauge, all the way up through 500 kC mil in tech. Whereas in a VFD cable, in Canada at least, we're offering 1 kV from 12 gauge up to 500 kC mil. But keep in mind, the aluminum sheath in the VFD cable for Canada and the US is designed to be that high frequency bond path with three separate bare bonding conductors, each placed between pairs of phase conductors within our VFD cable. The tech cable would only have one bonding conductor, so not that true balanced symmetrical construction of a true VFD cable. And the aluminum interlocked armor on our tech cables is not designed to be a conductor. It's merely designed to be a mechanical protection for the cable. It has no shielding effectiveness. So you're losing the shield, you're losing the high frequency bond path, you're losing the balanced symmetrical nature of the cable. It's a matter of time before you have issues if you use a tech cable. That's really what it comes down to. Very good, thank you. Uh, I've got a couple questions here that are actually quite similar, so I'll uh, I'll try to paraphrase them. Uh, now, is there a variable frequency drive size, amperage or horsepower, that above that size, VFD cabling is just absolutely recommended? 
or is it just recommended for all EFD sizes? And uh, again, uh, another question says, you know, I have heard sometimes that lengths less than 20 feet may not require VFD rated cables. Uh, well, very good questions as well. Um, okay, so we've, there, there's a wealth of experience and knowledge out there and um, we've talked with a few of these companies that have, have generated business out of troubleshooting VFD systems. And in talking with them, they've stated that regardless of the drive size, fractional horsepower, all the way up to tens or hundreds of horsepower, if it's a VFD, if it's a pulse width modulated waveform output, if it's not a sinusoidal output, you're going to have high frequency components. You can add the filters to your heart's content. You can add shaft grounding it will not change anything. It'll improve it, but it won't improve it to the point of not being an issue. The VFD cable in VFD systems is critical. Um, to put it in perspective, there's been cases where in a fractional horsepower drive, uh, running a, um, I believe it was a pump for a building, a water pump, fresh water pump for a building, Every time that pump would run, the local alarm system would go down. So EMI issues, clearly there, as well as others. In the case of short runs, 20 feet or less, we've heard of cases where every time a, um, I believe it was a 20 horse or to that effect motor would run, um, in that short 20 foot length of Tech 90 cable between the drive and the motor, the drive was practically mounted right on top of the motor. That's how short a length we're talking. Every time that pump would run, a local AM radio station was having trouble broadcasting. It, it's pretty clear that regardless of the length, regardless of the size, there's issues. So I, I don't think you can just say, well, oh, I'm mounting the drive directly on top of the motor. I don't need a VFD cable. You may still need a VFD cable. Man, there's a lot to think about there. And I want to thank everybody. The questions are coming in fast and furious. So we're going to try to get to as many as we can. Uh, but again, uh, Isaac has left his uh, uh, the contact email address, the uh, the last slide that you see there on your screen. So we are trying to get to everybody, but uh, you know, again, please uh, you know use that email contact, Isaac. Uh, a, if we don't get to you, or B, you know, just in the time we have, we can't give a uh, a big enough explanation or long enough explanation. Uh, now, Isaac, I did receive a few questions uh, regarding line and load reactors. Um, you know, one person asks, are line and load reactors required? And uh, another person asks, how much impact do reactors have in conjunction with the spikes? Line and load reactors, um, as I know it, will help with the spikes, and many drive manufacturers will require them in their product literature, in their manuals. Again, Going back to that earlier slide on installation tips, those drive manufacturers are, are the experts with their drives. If they demand, if they suggest using line and load reactors, then do it. Um, I, I, I think it's pretty clear. Um, uh, they will help, but no matter what type of filtering you add, you won't remove the need for a VFD cable. That's really what it comes down to. And the big misconception out there is that, oh, I'll just add filters to this system and I won't need a VFD cable. I could just use a tech cable or uh, a whole mash of T90 nylon and EMT. We've seen that too. And systems start failing, problems start arising. So drive manufacturer, their documentation, their expertise is critical to a successful drive installation. Very good. Uh, now this one, um, we have Ted and he's asking, uh, or, or he's saying, I have frequently specified an inductor near the motor. Does the use of variable frequency drive cable eliminate this need? I don't think it would. I think what you're doing there, uh, if, if I'm not mistaken, is trying to help with this reflected wave phenomenon. Uh, 
um, th this is where it may be important to get a hold of the drive manufacturer and uh, get some information on how much of an effect that adding that reactor, act adding that system to the drive system would help. Um, there may be instances I could imagine where it may not help. Um, the drive manufacturer is important here to consider. Okay, and moving along, and uh, I, I apologize if I'm making Isaac uh, repeat some of the same things he already said. Uh, that's a failure on my part with all these questions that are coming in. But one of the things that uh, I did want to bring up, and it was brought up by one of our uh, attendees as well, uh, has to do with listings classifications for variable frequency drive cables, um, whether it's UL, uh, CSA or what have you. Can can you speak to some of those uh, some of those listings as they pertain to these cables? The VFD cables fall under some very general standards <clears throat> for building wire cables, which allow for VFD constructions. And Canada will leverage quite often CSA C22.2 number 123 for type RA90 or aluminum sheathed cables. It allows for multiple bond conductors in a cable with cross-link polyethylene insulated conductors. So three bare bond, three cross-link polyethylene insulated conductors. It recognizes a 1 kV voltage rating and the aluminum sheath armor. Likewise in the US, we would be looking to a UL 1569 type MC which would allow for the same type of construction but 600 volt rated. Again, there's an allowance for one or more bonding conductors or equipment grounding conductors within the cable. PVC jackets are allowed by both. Both may be CSA certified or UL listed as an HL cable. So MC type eight, or MC HL in the US or uh, HL type designation or uh, marking rather in Canada. So both are available. The flexible constructions, I believe, fall under standards. I can provide more information um, if needed on that as well. Now, of course, Isaac, I was expecting uh, this question to uh, come up at some point. Uh, could you discuss some of the, uh, the price differences, a comparison uh, of tech versus VFD cables. Now, whether that's expressed as a percentage or a dollar value, I, I leave up to you. One of the good things about being involved at Nexans and the technical group is I'm, I, I'm somewhat disconnected from the commercial side. So commenting on price, I don't know that I can off the top of my head saying what percentage one's worth more than the other and so on. There may be a slight adder. Let me put it that way for the VFD cables uh, versus a Tech 90 cable or cable and conduit. Ultimately, there's really no choice. A VFD cable has to be used. Um, installation practice is gonna change slightly, especially if you're considering the aluminum sheath armored cables. In those cases, it may be more favorable to go to a copper tape shielded cable for a VFD system, saving on some of the installation costs and may only be a slight adder, if any, above a Tech 90 cable. Keep in mind there's a copper tape there instead of aluminum interlocked armor, so there's gonna be a slight adder in materials. You have three bare bonds instead of one bonding conductor, so it could be a slightly different operation on manufacturing. Um, one kV insulation typically in Canada versus 600 volt rated in, uh, for a typical building wire system. So there's gonna be slight cost adders here and there. It shouldn't be uh, two or three times the cost for a VFD cable, it should not be that large. So the cost adder should be slight, but really it's a matter of a VFD cable is required in VFD systems. Okay, uh, another one that uh, is probably a, a little simpler than the uh, cost comparison is uh, someone is asking now when it comes to VFD rated cables, um, are they or are they not necessary on the line side of the drive? These VFD cables, keep in mind, were designed for pulse width modulated waveforms. These very wide frequency 
range waveforms from a few hertz up to the 100 plus megahertz range, right? So the output side of the VFD to the motor. On the line side, you're not going to see those high frequency components. If you do see them, they're going to be ever so slight. They're not going to be anywhere near the magnitude or severity of the output of the drive. So using a three conductor um, driver X VFD cable, for example, the aluminum sheathed version, on the input side of the VFD, there's really no electrical value to. The one reason for doing it may be that you've got an abundance of this cable and you're going to use it on, the, on both sides of the drive. The other advantage is leveraging other technical aspects of the cable, this idea of self-supporting and easily trained, bending it, lifting it into place, supporting every six feet or by code, and you're set. So there's other reasons to consider it, um, but it's not necessary on the line side or the input side of the VFD. Okay, very good. Hopefully that uh, that covers that. Um, now, uh, Kazi here uh, says that uh, you talked about connecting the cable shield to ground at both ends. Should cable deratings be considered when doing this, as the cable may heat up more during uh, circulating current? Uh, also a very good question. So it's been our experience that Single conductor cables such as RA90 or our CoreFlex cable brand under Nexans um, being aluminum sheathed over each individual conductor. If you bond both ends of that type of system where that aluminum sheath or that conductive material is around only one conductor, correction factors have to be accounted for for the phase conductor ampacity. So in other words, a reduction in maximum phase conductor ampacity. Where that sheath or that conductive system surrounds all three cables in the grouping or all the phase conductors, such as in a VFD cable, there's no need to account for that current or uh, add a derating factor, so to speak. Again, that's been our experience with the cable so far. And there's no code requirements to my knowledge to, to dictate any need to add a correction factor or derating factor in the case of a multi-conductor cable under one common sheet. Very good. Uh, now getting to the actual construction of the VFD cables, uh, Chris asks, uh, can you explain the purpose of having the three ground wires again? So the three bare bond conductors, each placed between pairs of phase conductors is, it gets rather technical, and this is where the drive manufacturers have a lot of wealth of documentation on the technical reasons. And it really comes down to common mode currents. Basically, this idea that if you take all three phase conductor voltages, add them up in a typical building wire sinusoidal output three phase system, you'll get precisely zero volts. In the case of a VFD and how they operate with switching dead times and so on, just like an inverter within a UPS power system, you'll get three phases that don't precisely add to zero. It'll create a common mode current or a ground current. Placing these each phase or each bond conductor between pairs of phase conductors will help reduce this current to a minimum essentially eliminating these bearing currents or these common mode currents. Again, that IEEE study from 1996 has a wealth of information on that fact, as well as the documentation from the drive manufacturers. Uh, just uh, again, uh, thank you everyone for sending in all these questions, just going through and, and trying to pick ones that we haven't accidentally covered before because there are so many coming through. Um, I know one that uh, is of interest to me uh, that uh, Cam brings up. Uh, now, when it comes to the Canadian Electrical Code, um, now we've got the 2018 edition coming out, obviously, next year. Um, 
I don't know offhand myself if there's going to be requirements for VFD cable in it, but uh, Cam asks, uh, let me just bring this up again here, um, why doesn't the CE code uh, you know, require all VFD installations to use VFD rated cable? Is that something that uh, we as an industry would, would like to see happen? So uh, currently within the Canadian Electrical Code uh, for Canada and the National Electrical Code for the US, I'm not aware of any requirements for VFD cables for VFD systems. I can't really say why that is for sure. Um, I believe that there should be some requirements in the code uh, from an electrical shock point of view, from a uh, hazardous location point of view. Um, so there is good safety justification. It may be limited in the applications where there's a, lar um, a safety, a large safety factor. It comes down to more performance and electrical uh, performance or longevity of the system and uh, interference with other systems. The code isn't always concerned with that. The electrical code is primarily concerned with safety, right? So if there's no large safety concern or the safety concerns are few and far between, it may not be on their radar to consider. I, I work with the Canadian Electrical Code committees, subcommittees and the part one committee for uh, to develop the code. And I would encourage anyone wishing to um, submit a proposal to add VFD requirements to the Canadian Electrical Code to do so. Um, if any assistance is needed on my part, I can definitely try to help. Feel free to contact me with that. Um, and I can lead you through the right people to contact and uh, how to generate a proposal on the topic. But I, I think it really is needed. Uh, very good. Uh, I think we've got time for one more question here, and I apologize if we've covered this before. I, I don't think we have, but uh, anyway, here goes. Um, now, it's uh, James who asks, um, you know, are there any special connectors that are required for VFD cables? When it comes to connectors for VFD cables, uh, we like to lean on that study from 1996 by that group of ABB engineers. It was really groundbreaking and and actually comparing typical building wire systems to VFD systems. One of their key concerns is this idea of 360 degree connection between that shield and the connector, maintaining shielding effectiveness, being a high frequency or rather wide frequency range bond path, providing the environmental qualities needed for the installation. For example, if it's a wet location, being a wet type connector. It all leads back to, again, that IEEE study by those ABB engineers had stated that HL connectors are typically of higher quality and therefore strongly recommended for VFD systems. Now, luckily in our VFD cables that we make, especially for the Canadian market, we manufacture all aluminum connectors, which act as a great shield and are tested to be bonding conductors for short circuit currents. So uh, substantially low impedance introduced into the system by using those connectors. Now, there are cases where the connectors, regardless of what you're considering, you may need an explosion proof connector. In that case, Choose the best quality explosion proof connector you can because that's the, the dictating factor within that installation location. VFD may have to suffer slightly because of it, but guaranteed if it's an explosion proof connector, it's going to be rugged, it's going to be of high quality, and it may act as a good shield and a good low impedance bond pack. Uh, excellent. Thank you for that tip, Isaac. Um, everyone, I'm sorry we couldn't get to everyone's questions. Uh, some of them were, were also repeats, um, or they look like repeats. So hopefully you got the information that you were looking for. And again, I, I cannot stress enough, Isaac has left that uh, email address up on his last slide. You know, do send him an email, reach out to him with any additional questions. Uh, but that's about all the time we have. 
Uh, again, be sure to visit ebmag.com slash webinars for all of our upcoming training sessions and links to recordings of past webinars, uh, which is soon to include this one. Uh, thanks to all of you for attending. Uh, thank you, Nexans, Isaac, uh, for bringing this information uh, to our audience. And I hope all of you have some takeaways you can implement right away. Have a safe and productive afternoon.